Our next speaker is Zikr Clark. He's co-founder and vice president for legal and governmental affairs for Farm Freezers and Greener Solutions. Victor's presentation will be on poultry mortality freezer units, better BMP, better biosecurity, better bottom line. Please welcome Victor. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I love coming to these conferences. You get to learn all these different things that are going on, um, and particularly with the nationwide scope of this one. Uh, we're going to switch gears, obviously. We're going to talk about poultry as opposed to hogs. Um, So um, <clears throat> one of the interesting things about the, the conference today, too, is that you know, a lot of the focus is on manure management. A lot of the agenda items, um, both yesterday and today and tomorrow, uh, focused on manure litter management. What the public generally um, fails to recognize is that that litter, that manure that we talk about being land applied, isn't just the manure. It is also made up of the birds that have been composted on these poultry farms. Okay which is, takes us to this slide. So this is from the Chesapeake Bay Program's uh, website here. In, in this case, and I'm talking about the Chesapeake Bay area, uh, Delmarva Peninsula, 90% of those nutrients are coming from manure applied to cropland. But what we don't make the distinction in these sorts of uh, statements is that dead chickens that were composted were a component of that material that gets land applied. And it shouldn't be overlooked. In this case, 23,000 tons was generated on Delmarva in 2013. That estimate uh, was come up by probably three or four years ago. The last two years of data we've been able to collect shows that that estimate is actually woefully inadequate. Um, just this past year there were 12 farms that came online using freezers uh, and recycling through rendering. That mortality was 600 tons in of itself. So clearly we have been underestimating the amount of uh, debt generated on the peninsula. Doing a little bit of history here, if we go back 25 or 30 years, most of the poultry operations on the Delmarva Peninsula and across the country actually use pit burial. So literally, it's just what it sounds. There was a big hole out back. There was usually a, a silo turned upside down and buried. And those were the birds were disposed of that way. About two decades or more ago, because of the impact on both ground and surface water, uh, the industry had to make a switch. In our area of the country, on the east coast largely, we switched to composting. Uh, the theory I have about that is that a lot of the research that went into composting was done by University of Delaware and University of Maryland, and other parts of the country went directly to the other mortality management practice we're going to talk about today, which is freezing. Composting, for those of you who I can't imagine anybody in the room here is not familiar with it, uh, is a very time-consuming and labor-intensive process. It's not a fun part of the job if you're operating a farm. Um, it also, unfortunately, attracts insects and scavengers, which is a big issue for us here of late, uh, particularly after 2015, a, a much greater focus on um, delivery of, of, of disease to the farm. And when done properly, the process transforms these chicken carcasses into a nutrient-rich compost for farm fields, an organic fertilizer. And that's a good thing. However, as you know, particularly in our part of the country, on the Delmarva Peninsula, we have too much nutrient-rich material. So on some level, it's, we're generating more nutrient-rich material, and yet we're still trying to find out where are we gonna go with the traditional manure or litter. There are no alternative uses in reality for compost. That's not true of pure litter. You've got uh, the mushroom farms in Pennsylvania. The material gets trucked up to there. There's a lot of manure to energy projects. You hear about them all the time. Many of those projects are calibrated specifically to handle a homogenous material. Litter, pure litter. Um, I, I had a conversation with one of the folks, uh, she's with the NRCS in uh, Virginia, Jane Corson Lassiter, I think I got that right. 
uh, and she was working on one of those projects. And again, because the Minorita Energy Project was calibrated for pure litter, when they hit a pocket of compost, uh, the machine didn't work. So right now, there really are no alternative uses for compost. Even the traditional <laughs> use for compost is not exactly a winner. If you talk to some of the crop farmers, they're not happy about compost. When they talk to the litter brokers, they segregate that litter. They want the pure litter, they don't want the compost. Partially, it's a physical thing. You've got bird parts clogging up their, their spreaders. Inconsistent nutrient content is another issue with composting. As you're all aware, we're moving toward precision ag practices where we're gonna use a GPS and map every inch of that cropland and make sure that we deliver the exact nutrients that we want. That cannot be done if we have pockets of material that we're not sure what that nutrient content is. So it's, it's not helpful in that front either. We began researching this uh, practice about five years ago or more now. Um, we came upon this practice. It, it actually already existed. This has been around for 20 years. It was the original patent was Tyson Foods. So this is not something that was retrofitted for this use. It was designed specifically for broiler chickens to be stored and then later rendered. As you can see here, um, it's a very small uh, shed. The footprint depends on the size of the farm, obviously, and I'll talk about that in a couple of slides. And then a customized vehicle comes between flocks to pick up the birds. Each farm has got the exact capacity it needs to handle the dead for the entire flock. So there is no truck traffic while live birds are there, which is an important distinction because some of the trouble we had out in the Midwest in 2015, some of it was linked to truck traffic. So we've reduced that truck traffic. In fact, we've eliminated it. It will be once a flock after the live birds have moved and before the next flock is, is, is delivered. One of the benefits or one of the big benefits of rendering is that it is truly recycling. It's a high pressure, high heat process. Um, at the end of that process, you have three things. You have water, which is largely lost as steam. You have a protein meal and a poultry fat. Each of those is sold on the commodities market, just like corn and soybeans are sold on the commodities market. Some of the end uses for those things, uh, the example there, feedstock for biofuels. That poultry fat can be used as a feedstock for biofuels. The protein meals can be used either as an ingredient, another ag uh, feed or aquaculture, like the fish flakes in your fish tank at home. <clears throat> another benefit in comparison to some of the other BMPs that are available is that there is no second step land application required. So if you're composting, and again, it's a great thing, but ultimately that material does get land applied. If you're using incinerator, that you may have reduced the volume to 10% of what you started with, but all that phosphorus is still captured in that ash and then that's land applied. So that's one of the benefits here is we're removing that material entirely from the farm setting. <coughs> As I mentioned a minute ago, this is not new. It was new to our area, so we had to do a lot of research and learn more about it, but it's not new. And it's important to say that because a lot of people don't want to be early adopters. I don't want to be the guy on the street with the new gadget that may or may not pan out. It's been in use for 20 years. Um, in fact, uh, the NRCS, it's an actual uh, uh, cost share eligible NRCS practice. So again, you know that that took a while to get that done. That doesn't happen overnight. Here's a couple more uh, photos. Uh, smaller shed with just two units. This, um, this is a retrofitted bin composter. So it's also an opportunity there to save money on the infrastructure and give new life to an, an old structure that may not be used anymore. <coughs> The other benefit to this is that you know what you're getting. A pound of chicken is a pound of chicken. Uh, some other BMPs, maybe it's a vegetative buffer or cover crops in the lab, you know, on, in the books, you, you're pretty confident what those numbers are. Out in the real world though, that vegetative buffer may get X, Y, Z on this farm, but on this farm field, you may not get exactly the same efficacy. Um, in this case, it's literally pound for pound of chicken. How much N and P are captured in each pound of that chicken? And we have that number. Um, a benefit to that is that um, because we can calculate that number, uh, Jesse Bay program recently gave this practice interim BMP status, which allows the states in the watershed uh, area to use this practice for their uh, watershed implementation planning going forward. Once that, pra once that practice is approved through a science panel, then all that work from the, from the time it was approved as an interim practice up until the time it's approved, all that will get grandfathered in. One other point related to this, when you heard, I think it was Kelly earlier today, maybe not, was talking about the uh, nutrient credit trading market. 
one of my hopes is that once the Bay program finishes its work and improves this as a final uh, practice, my understanding and having some conversations with the woman in charge of the Maryland Nutrient uh, Credit Trading Market um, is that if it fills that benchmark uh, through the Bay program, it could then be added to that list. Why that's important? Most of the credits that are traded now are from big point source to point source or to big operations. If we could get something on the books that was at the farm level, maybe it's not a large number of credits, but then we aggregate those credits. This might give us our first shot of actually Joe, Susie, or Bob at the farm level participating in the credit market. And it's largely going to be because we know what those numbers are and we can count on them. Um, oh, so my, my point earlier about removing the material entirely from the farm setting, this is where you're really getting you know, the bang for your buck. Because the second step isn't land application, you're removing that material. These are the kind of numbers you can get uh, uh, using this practice. So originally we used to say, oh, this is 85 or 90 percent more cost effective. Um, but then we flipped it on its head and said, what if we said, how much benefit can we get from a million dollars? And we've heard it, I think, two or three times earlier today in the conference. You know, the budgets are getting smaller. We're going to have to start making choices. Um, and we're going to have to start using cost effectiveness as one of those measures. But then just to be clear, that, that percent, that's over the average of these other BMPs. It isn't the one head-to-head, -head. that's over the average. The same is true with nitrogen. Um, in case it's 40 to 55% or 50% more cost effective, when you see these bar charts, I know my reaction would be, those are crazy numbers that can't be right. But it really just goes back to the fact that that material is being removed entirely from the farm setting. I get this, I, this is a new slide for those of you who have actually sat through this presentation before. I get this question all the time, is how do we get the numbers on this capacity thing? So I wanted to share this with you because this was a lot of research as well. In other parts of the country where this had been done, in Texas and Arkansas with Pilgrim's Pride or uh, Alabama and Georgia with some of the other, uh, Tyson and other groups, many of those places were like a company town. There was one processing plant and everybody within 60 to 100 miles grew for that one processing plant. Everybody grew the same size bird. They used the same size chicken houses. So they had a rule of thumb. It was two freezers per house. When we first started this project on the Delmarva Peninsula, we have five. And if you count Coleman Foods, we have six integrators. When you drive down a road on the eastern shore of Maryland, you will see a Purdue farm, a Tyson farm, a Coleman Foods farm. We couldn't go with the rule of thumb. So we literally had to take, this is the data from the agri-stats uh, for our region. And it takes literally day by day, these week by week, the mortality rate as well as the size of the bird. We use this, uh, where is it right here? So you plug in the, the size of the flock and the, the number of grow out days or finished bird weight. And we can tell you, based on this per cubic foot, we can say, okay, this farm needs 3.45 freezer units. Now, Obviously, your mortality rate fluctuates from flock to flock. So we add in a 15% cushion that takes you up to 3.96, and of course, you can't have 3.96 of something. So this farm needs four freezer units. Another beautiful thing about this, and, and credit goes to the NRCS. We work very closely with the Delaware NRCS in developing this um, this matrix. Uh, Steve Kemmerel, many of you guys know him, it's big help on this. He then took and added in power consumption. So now we can tell you that this farm. This size farm, this $75,000, 75,000 bird flock, $91 per flock. That's not per box, that's for the whole flock, for the whole practice. Here's the other beauty. We can also tell this farmer exactly how much NNP per flock and per year he or she will be diverting from land application. So anyway, this is pretty exciting stuff for us. We thought this was, it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. You heard a lot about the water, uh, uh, Chesapeake uh, BMP watershed uh, this morning from Kelly. That particular Bay program is moving toward a verification phase, is what I understand. So while the early years were a lot about uh, getting those practices out in the field, they're sort of going to take a breath now and say, all right, we've done all this work. Let's go back and take a look and see if what we thought we were getting, we're getting. Um, the benefit of this, again, is because if we're talking about pound to pound of chicken, it's not very hard to get verification. It's also not. It's also not very hard uh, for compliance. It's not hard. I mean, the, the, the farmer still walks the chicken houses every day and pulls out the dead, drops the bird in the box and closes the door, never has to touch that material again. The, the truck comes at the end of the flock. So as far as the, and that's the next slide. 
labor savings, operational savings on the farm. Now, these figures are a little bit dated. We, they're two years old, so we need to update them. But in this case, the average farm could realize about $1,600 a year in operational savings, and that is largely labor. Improved quality of life. Uh, not a bottom line issue, but still a big deal. A lot of growers live right on the same farm in their houses. Their chicken houses are not that far away from their house. The same thing with neighbors um, in our area of the country. Um, and I, I'm pretty confident it's true of every other part of the country. When new operations are built or there's expanded operations, a lot of people, residential folks have moved into the neighborhood. They wanted to live in the country, but they didn't realize they were gonna be next to a farm. Um, a, a lot of the complaints are related to the flies and the scavengers and the smells. And on a poultry farm, most of that is the composting shed. Um, so there is a way that we can reduce the things that the neighbors don't like without adding more regulatory burden. My, the last point here, I got three more slides, but this is the last point, is biosecurity. Big deal, really big deal, obviously, after 2015. Um, we have spent, as an industry, a lot of effort and a lot of time focusing on human activity. There are foot baths in front of every chicken house. We get to keep a log book. You know, uh, a lot of good work's being done there. What we haven't focused on a lot, until recently, to be fair, actually the, the, the topic has come up a lot more in the last year or so, um, was the animal activity on these farms. Uh, there's been recent research, um, National Wildlife Research Center, if anybody from that group is here, where they demonstrated that mammals, which they previously knew could carry AI, they actually had uh, mammals actually uh, transmit AI to birds, and I think it was rabbits to ducks, but don't hold me to that. But there was mammalian transfer to avian. Um, so it's a real issue, it's a real issue. And because of composting, and again, it's nobody's fault, it is an open air shed. And basically it serves as a, as a food source for the foxes, the buzzards, and let's see if this works. Did work earlier. All right. Well, if you could imagine, <laughs> <laughs> what we actually did, um, we put a game camera inside of a composting shed and let it run over the course of one evening. It was unbelievable how much activity. So, if we could get this working. At the end of the day, you see a, a tremendous number of buzzards during daylight. It turns night, there's raccoons, there's feral cats. Um, oh, here we go, good job. Well, important to remember, this is one night. This isn't, we didn't take the greatest hits from 100 farms and compile them into one video. This is one night on one farm. And you can see by the date timestamp right here. Now, what's interesting is these animals don't usually play together, <laughs> right? But there's so much food there, it's like, why fight? Now, this is very interesting, watch this. The fox does not eat in the composting shed. So that fox just dragged that carcass across three more farm fields and possibly your farm. Um, and this goes on every night. This isn't, I know, I mean, poultry goers we talk to, they always know something goes on or there's a little something going on. But we put the game camera in here and this is all one night, there's all this activity and there was, a ton more activity, we had to actually edit it. <clears throat> so again, I mean, you know, composting is a, is a process, it's a good process and it can work. Um, I, you know, one of the things that I learned recently uh, from a friend that left us recently, Bill Brown, he was doing a composting class that I attended. And what he said to me, which is pretty smart, he said, when we develop composting, the average chicken was about six pounds. I think it's, I'm making that number up, but it was a much smaller chicken. He said, the birds were raising, now my partner's farm, he raises eight and a half, nine pound birds for Mount Air. He said, you know, we didn't design composting to work for, you know, that size bird. So it's not surprising that there are issues with it. The last two points are this. The reason why this is better biosecurity, the chance of a bird, you know, the migratory bird carrying AI or whatever har other horrible thing, the chance of that bird uh, touching your farm, probably pretty small. What's the better chance is that bird lands in a waterway within five miles of that farm. And that's the same waterway that those animals you just saw, the fox, uh, the raccoon, that's the same waterway they visit each night. Then they bring it back to the farm 
where it ends up going through the whole farm. The flip side of that is if this farm has freezer units and for whatever reason contracts some sort of disease, we can contain it to that farm. The material will be locked in a lockbox. So later it's determined, wow, that farm was hot. None of that material was left in the composting shed to be uh, shared with neighbors. Okay, we're out of time. Yep. Um, you have Perfect. questions? Victor, are you going to be here? I will be here. Okay. I appreciate that. Victor will be around. If we have any questions for Victor, just stop him and ask him. Um, our next speaker. <laughs> is